The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Everybody who reads the Bible, they go through two transition points. The first one is you begin to read the Bible. You accept what it says. But then you find other folks who believe just like you. And you say, wow, I got a brand new family. There are other people out there that are not like the people in the world who reject me. Now, keep in mind, this rejection is not a person outright rejecting you. It's them rejecting your ideologies. So they reject that, and you may feel they're rejecting you because they don't really accept what you're trying to say. Anyway, you find Christians, and you're so happy you can find someone to fellowship. And because you've been hurt, because you've been rejected, because you've been pushed away, one of the first things you do in that transition is you try to be accepted by those who believe in Christ. And what do we do when we try to be accepted by those who believe in Christ? We try to impress upon the other person how needful we are. Because if it's one thing, after being hurt, after being shoved aside, after being betrayed, after being backstabbed, the one thing you want is to be needed. And so what we normally do is we start giving everybody our resume. We study people. That's part of the first transition. We look around, we study people, we see how people talk and what they know and everything else. Uh, what somebody else's comment is towards somebody else's statement. And we begin to emulate and find, we, we qualify the individuals who believe in Christ. Normally that comes through finding your group, finding your group you belong to as first phase. And in that we begin to become just like those we were introduced to. Well, that normally follows by something it's not going to be quite your taste. That leads a person into an area where they begin to see principles not quite being exercised by these groups. And you, you, you come to find out, you start to hear gossip. That normally happens also, right? It, it's amazing, but it happens. You begin to be exposed to people gossiping about somebody else, and then you sit down and you think, how can people do this? They're supposed to be Christians. They're not supposed to talk and plot about somebody else and say that a person is evil. Now, mind you, you think this way after you have adopted their principles. Because if you want to be included, not pushed away, because they're your Christian family. And if somebody agrees with your idea, that strengthens the glue from you in that group. Well, after being a while in these groups, you begin to grow some more. And as you grow, you find out that the people around you are growing in the wrong direction. You may even recognize how they have become bitter against each other. You begin to see jealousy amongst uh, uh, the people who believe and you say they shouldn't be. And all of a sudden, you'll stand up in your own strength and one day you'll say something is not quite right. And in that day, that's when you become the target of the very group you were loyal to, of the very group you thought you found in Christ. And that's when you're hurt in your heart spiritually. That's when you stop trusting everybody who says, I believe in Christ. And then you find yourself alone again. And it's sometimes it takes many years to find any like-minded individual because you don't trust people who say they believe in Christ anymore. You know that's just a cover so they can get close and, and do the same things they were doing in the world, but this time within a group. And then the second transition takes place. It never fails. You'll always meet someone who will point you right back to the Word of God. They're not going to point you to themselves, right? They're not going to say, come listen to me. I'm the greatest person that ever spoke. They're going to speak to you to get your relationship right with Christ. That same person is going to begin to go against many different ideologies that you once held. And they're going to point you right back to the Messiah. And then when you get that relationship with the Messiah going, that's when your life begins to heal. But it is, there are so many obstacles in that area of life, right? But this is the point. You may not know, this is the point when you grow beyond the need of having somebody else accept you. This is when your personal relationship with Christ begins to flourish. And then that fulfillment that you've been looking for all your lives comes directly from Jesus Christ. This is when you consider him differently. You don't consider him as part of the group. You consider him as an individual. You begin to recognize as to what he actually did. You're not blown away by the hype anymore of a conversation, but you seek to go much deeper, and that's intimacy. Now, once you reach this stage, you're going to go through lots of different stages in your life, but you will ultimately reach the area of that 
that absolute surrender. And what I mean by that is you'll begin to see life very differently one day. You'll begin to see life as something totally different than what anybody else around you likely, or it's a high probability of that, what they see it as. You'll begin to see that through the perspective of the gospel, not through the perspective of a person who wants to go to heaven. You cease to think about that, and the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes the most important factor in your life. Well, on that path you find the kingdom. When you find the kingdom, you're like a small child again. You realize how much you never knew in the first place. That's when you stop bragging about how much you know. You're not trying to impress a person by reading scripture, quoting anything. But you seek a very sincere relationship with Christ. But it's also when it is affirmed to you that the end times are forming without fail. You can explain it. You cannot articulate it. But something in you is starts to wake up and it lets you know that time may not be what you think it is and then you begin to look around at everybody else and you may become saddened because they're living their lives as though it's going to continue that way for a long time and then that final transition while you're in this flesh pops up once you go down that path that's when you completely surrender you no longer care about your condition that's not up on your priorities when you're broken that's not in your list of priorities. If you have necessities, those are not in your lists of priorities. At that point, you're willing to do whatever it takes because everybody in your life except you becomes an emergency. And you're truly ready to lay down anything you have to so that somebody else can have sight to see Christ. That's when you start leading people directly to Christ. Not to yourself, not to what you have to say, not to what you have to offer, but directly to Christ. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the invite of the Holy Spirit. In the, in the Bible, that's when the apostles were made to be filled with the Holy Spirit, when they were ready, when they were ready to forego themselves for the sake of the gospel. Because I want you to think about something. If a sinner is nothing more than a sick person, and a saved person is truly a sick person that has seen the physician. Then in the world, there are lots of sick people. And you realize you've been sick yourself. And the only thing, out of all of what you went through, the only thing that lifted you out of that sickness is Christ. It was not man's formula. It was not the instructions that somebody gave you to follow very closely. Because nothing man ever gave you panned out, did it? You may have wanted to honor the person and not really threw the person under the bus. And so you may not have told that person it didn't work out like you said. But deep down inside, you know that everything that man has tried to formulate for you failed. And then somehow the Lord begins to do things in your lives that you can have no formula for. You're not going to write down the steps, right? You're not going to do that. Because the truth is that if we all face that truth, here's the truth. We can't really articulate nor clearly know how in the world we just got out of a situation. We don't know how in the world we got to this point. We cannot write down all the steps. We remember bits and pieces of it. But the truth is, by the time we came to our senses, we were fully delivered. We were immersed in some type of situation, scenario, or something else. And before we knew it, things had changed and we were delivered from that past event. And we cannot tell you what the steps were. All we know is that we endured it. That's when you're truly delivered. That's deliverance of truth. That's when you cannot give credit to a person like me. You can't give credit to your neighbor. You can't give credit to anybody else but Christ. That's when you say, no, nobody else did this for me but Christ. You know, don't be offended, but you didn't do it. Your steps you gave me, they didn't quite work out. Jesus did this, and I'm not even sure how he did it. I don't care what the steps were, how he did it, and it was with love, and it was necessary. That's what I can tell you. And then if a person goes deeper, you, the only thing you can tell a person is, hang in there, he'll deliver you too. See, that's a very real statement, but it's the statement nobody wants to hear when they begin this walk. You don't want to hear somebody say, just hang in there. That's not what you want to hear. But come to find out, that's precisely what you say. Because you, what are you going to tell a person? You can't tell them the steps from A to B. You can't write it down, put it in a book. All you can tell a person is hang in there. He loves you. He will deliver you. And what you're going through, it's not going to last forever. Right? All you can do is encourage that person. 
Well, when you hit that step and you do encourage people, but you're truly ready to do a little more, then you're truly marked. When you're still hungry after that point to do something for somebody else, that's a heavenly desire in you that the Father will absolutely fulfill. You were marked to be saved. That's why you knew who Jesus was when you were young. Guess what? You're also marked for habitation of the Holy Ghost. You know that, don't you? You're marked for habitation of the Holy Ghost. And listen, two people who have the Holy Ghost who never met each other in their lives, you know what happens? They do not contradict on any statement concerning Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because they do not speak of themselves, but they're partakers of a heavenly gift, a true heavenly gift that has one voice, one truth, one light, one way. Nothing is divided anymore. When you're a partaker of the Holy Spirit, you don't have a difference of opinion. You don't have that because you have become something else. And somebody asked the other day, they were talking about that scripture, how that a person, once they blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they can't be bought back. It's because you have to, do you understand what you have to do to break from that power? Having tasted of that heavenly gift, you already know what eternity is. You already know that things are right at your feet. You already know that. So you don't walk around trying to be healed yourself and all this stuff. You already know that's at your feet. You are impressed to be obedient and there are many things you do know that you will not communicate. You have to, you have to break away and actually hate Christ to break away from that. It's almost impossible to fall away like that. It's almost impossible for someone to blaspheme the Holy Ghost once they have been a partaker. See, the Bible is clear. People who blaspheme the Holy Ghost, but they were never partakers of the Holy Ghost, cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. In order to disrespect something, you have to know it first. Or your disrespect is simply ignorance. It is not blasphemy. You're just speaking out of your mouth. You're speaking in ignorance. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to blaspheme with experience. If you have been a partaker, in order for you to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you have to be equally as evil as Satan is himself, if not more. If you have an ounce of love in you, you're not going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit because you're always going to put somebody else first. What do you think Satan tries very hard in your youth to get you to stop living like that? The one attack that's been on you since the beginning is that you do not openly love other people. Satan has come to you in many different forms and he said this one statement, be careful, they'll get you. If you're naive, be careful, they'll get you. Because he was trying to get you not to love anybody with an agape love. He was trying to get you to love with a earth-based love, which is conditional love. God's love is unconditional. It's not based on what a person is doing right and what they're doing wrong. It's based on truth. It's based on something a devil cannot see. Satan cannot see. Only something God can see and that you're partakers of and your eyes can be open to it. He's worked very hard to get you to negate love in your life. He sent you all types of things and he told you it was love, but it was not. Most of it was lust. Most of it was some plot or ploy from the enemy from the beginning. That's what most of it was. Very seldom have people had true experience with love itself. Because if you have an experience with love, it is never absent sacrifice. Love is never absent forgiveness. And love is never absent the truth. That's why devils cannot operate in your home where you would stand to forgive and love somebody not based on you know what they're doing for you, but to love them in truth. And every single person who believes in Christ for real, who believes that he came in the flesh, who believes that he died and was resurrected for their sins. Now listen, I'm not talking about if you believe that he died and was resurrected. Devils know that. I'm not talking about that. When you believe that he died for your sins, now you believe. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross, and that he was raised from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father. Devils know that. Satan understands that. He knows that. But not one demon, not one devil, not one of the fallen believe that Jesus did that for them. When you believe he did that for you, I'm telling you something right now. When you believe that he died for you, took your place, washed your sins away, your life is not going to be the same. And this gives you an open eye to Satan's second primary weapon. To get you to comply with believing that Jesus died on the cross 
was raised from the dead and went to heaven, sure. But to doubt that he has washed away all of your sins, Satan does not want you to know that Jesus took your place. See, because he cannot accuse you if you know that. Somebody could come to you with every accusation in the world, and guess what? If you don't believe that Jesus took your place for that very sin, you're going to bow out of whatever you were doing. You're going to go back to the cave. You're going to take yourself out of the good fight of faith. But when you believe that Jesus died for your sins, then you know you have an advocate. Because if he died for your sins when you were rotten, how much more will he do for you when you're converted? That's why Satan never wants you to know that. He wants you to continue to doubt yourself. He wants you to continue to condemn yourself, to damn yourself. That's what he wants. So you will never do anything. Can I tell you a secret here? That season should be over. Don't let that season back in your life. End that season today by finally saying, Nope, the Lord died for me. That's when you're believing. You're not believing if you don't believe he died for you. You're not accepting of the cross. Many people have lasted a long time and they did not believe that Jesus died for them. They have been living in self-condemnation, limited in everything they do, full of doubt, full of remorse, full of guilt. That's exactly where Satan wants you. In that season, by finally saying, nope, Jesus died for me. Because I'm telling you now, that changes things. And when you believe that, listen, if he died for you, you're not going to keep your sin, nor will you condemn yourself. Because anything Satan could accuse you on, Jesus died for. But now take note, he died before you were born. That means he had already died and was resurrected before you were born. He sat at the right hand of the Father and then you began to sin. So don't let Satan say, well, you know, you could sin tomorrow. Is he going to die for that one too? Yes, it covers you fully. From the beginning of your life to the time when you depart this earth, it covers everything. To receive that is to repent, is to acknowledge. The acknowledgement is important. Not to say you're squeaky clean, you're not that bad. But to be wide open and say, yep, I'm a sinner too. I'm a sick person on this earth. I partake in many things. And then you say, Jimmy crack corn, because I don't want to do that stuff. And you step right to the Messiah into your rightful place within the blood of the Lamb, which is the secret place of the Most High. That's when you abide under the shadow of the Almighty, by way of the blood of the Lamb. And that term means by way of a sacrifice. That means you receive that He took your place, that He paid the price in full, that you're bought with a price, a very high price. And if you're bought with a price, our Father's not like us. If we pay for something, a high price for something, we could lose interest. Go through it in a corner and it gets dusty. Our Father is not like that. Anything he ever purchased at a high cost, he never looked away from. Do you know that? Yes, his eyes are on your situation. That's why Satan has no permission to touch you, lest God find it needful for the victory in your life. So don't believe that Satan could just come to you when he wants to. That's a lie. See how mythos can trap people in the body of Christ. Send your mind in a thousand different directions to the point where everything fractures and you're left hopeless. That season should be over. Don't keep that season. Let that season go. Stop keeping it. Stop keeping the lies of the enemy that condemn you. Stop it. Somebody asked me about cigarettes. C cigarettes? And people don't like my comments on cigarettes. You ready? Here it goes. Are cigarettes going to keep you out of heaven? They most certainly will not. The sacrifice of Christ is serious. We're not talking about topical things. You know what's worse than smoking a cigarette? Ingesting a lie from somebody else. You know what's worse than exhaling smoke of anything? Tail bearing. Destroying somebody else's life by gossip. These physical habits that we have formed. There, there was a person taking blood pressure medication and he bragged. He said, I'm not addicted to anything. I said, yes, you are. You just don't see it that way. See how free you live because you don't know you're addicted. He says, well, name one thing I'm addicted to. I said, your body is addicted to blood pressure medication because if you don't have it, you're going to go out of whack. You may not crave it, but if you don't have it, you're going to go out of whack. And then I told him, it's not going to keep you out of heaven. You know, it was a common custom. But there are lots of customs. 
when Jesus was around. Do you know that? Customs people don't know about today. Jesus died to save the soul. He did not die to save your flesh. And what you do on this earth, you do to your flesh. But let me tell you something. What you believe of evil damages the soul. And that's of grave concern. Your soul. When this body is gone, you'll have no addictions. When this body is gone, you'll have no hang-ups. When this body is gone, many things will be gone with it. But if you're believing these lies of darkness, you damage your soul. And your soul is eternal. See, I found in life you can barely find enough to get up and go for yourself. But for somebody else, you can muster more than what you are. And that's based on simple love. When you focus your life on getting somebody else the gospel, that's when you become patient. If you're talking to someone that does not want to hear you, then don't talk when they don't want to hear you. But you never give up. I never go to someone and expect them to hear what I'm saying when I want them to hear but I stand ready to talk to them when they're ready to hear. It's a big difference, and it makes a big difference. That's just simple, uh, that's simple patience. These conditions we have in our bodies, for anybody who has a condition in their body, it's only going to be your limitation if you wanted it for you. But I'll share this with you. When an angel is assigned from God to go do something, in the assignment itself is an anointing to go and do whatever God said to do. If God never instructed an angel, they're limited as to what they can do. And if you don't believe me, look at the fallen. If they had as much power as they had in the beginning, all this would not be. But when God assigns any of you an angel to do anything, he anoints you to do it. He empowers you to do it. He blesses you to have an ability to do it. Whatever it takes, you will be blessed to do it. I know that for a fact because there's no way I should be able to still play, right? instruments or type the way I type. I type pretty fast and I can't feel anything. I still do not look at the keyboard and I cannot feel a thing, right? I know that because I've chopped through my fingers. I have. I've burnt myself bad and didn't even know it. That's a fact. I can't feel anything, right? So there's no feeling. It's like your leg going to sleep. It just feels like a blob. That's what it feels like, a blob. And so you have to train yourself differently. But when it comes to somebody else, when you, when you focus your love on others, all of a sudden, another mechanism you never knew about kicks in internally in your spirit. You may not know about it right now, because in all honesty, you may be trying to get better at doing something so you can make your living. And that may be your modus operandi. That may be your major motivation. So I'll give you a challenge. For anybody out there who is just trying to make it, and maybe you're disadvantaged because of health reasons, you're just trying to make it and you get depressed because you don't know how you're going to make it. I give you a challenge. Change it all. Don't let your life just be about you living. Because what do we render to the living God? If, if God equipped me with everything I needed, the strength, the stamina, and everything else, and I went and gave the word to somebody, what have I truly done? I've done what everybody else can do if they had the same thing. Correct? If you were given the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, the strength, the stamina to preach, you would preach. Is that a big feat or not? Does that show anything about your character or not? It doesn't. Because if somebody has an ability to do something, then they'll naturally do it. They're going to work within their ability. It's when you don't have an ability to do something. It's when you face that disadvantage. Who you really are starts to come out. Then your spiritual person rises because your flesh can't do it anymore right? Who you really are begins to surface when you're disadvantaged. That's when your work, whatever you're doing, when you do it for the sake of somebody else, that's when God accompanies what you do. I'm, I'm just telling you right now, every doctor has said the same thing. There's, it's impossible for me to do what I do. I'm an impossible patient. I shouldn't be able to do half the things I do, but I'm not doing them for me. It's not some hero thing either. It's, it's based off something so simple. Look at your children. If you broke your leg and, you're ch and you lost your crutches or whatever the case was, and your cast fell off, but your kids were stuck in a snowstorm and they needed to get to your front door, would you crawl to that front door? You probably would. In fact, you would get to that front door so quick, somebody would think you were okay. You would endure all pain and everything else necessary to get to the front door, not to be a hero, but to get them out of the cold. Something that simple. 
People accomplish great feats, what other people call great feats, when in truth, it's what God empowers us to do and what's built inside of our spirits when we do things based off love, off simple love. And for all of you who are disadvantaged, or you think you're disadvantaged, change your reason as to why you're doing things and watch what happens. Change your reason. Never look for any repayment. Don't look for recognition. Right? I never told anybody about this. Hardly anybody ever knows about this. They don't know about the, my personal condition. They don't know about that. And the only reason I'm mentioning it is to encourage some of you in truth. Because I, you guys don't hear me come on there. Well, you know, my fingers are, you know, and, 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 and I hurt in this place and that area. And it feels like that fell off. I don't speak like that, do I? I don't do that because it's not necessary. That's not part of my life. My life is not a big complaint. It's about overcoming. It's about the character of who we really are. And you may not know this, but who you really are is being forged. You know what the Bible says? He learned obedience through sufferings. Now, some people read that as some bad thing, right? A terrible thing. He learned obedience through sufferings. I don't want to go through that. No. No, you have to really listen to that scripture. When he suffered, his cause was qualified. Your cause can be qualified. Your cause can be qualified. And when it's qualified, it does not matter what you don't have. It really matters what you're willing to do. Because based off what you're willing to do, based off your intent, God can manifest the rest as he sees fit. He manifests it. If we were perfectly healthy, we would corrupt ourselves. We'd be teenagers again. When we have limitations in the human body and it starts to slow us down, of course it aggravates us. Of course it does not feel good. But it causes us to mature spiritually, of which we cannot do without. And when you mature spiritually enough, a quickening comes. Why? Because you'll not corrupt yourself if you were totally mended. Some people cannot be healed right now because they would corrupt themselves. The advice I'm giving you is find a new cause to do what you do all the time. Devote your causes in truth and in love. See, we all say we love the Lord. We all say we want to go with Him. But the truth is, all too often, we do live for ourselves. We do. And it's kind of, you know, it's unknown territory when a person would live for somebody else. Because all we're interested in sometimes is what are we going to get out of this? How can I sustain myself? Everything is about me, 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 me. And what I'm telling you is that when you make it about somebody else, you're going to find that your father's involved big time. He'll do whatever's necessary to have you go in his word forward. And here's the big thing, right? Out of all the stuff we try to achieve, we never seem to find that place that gives us peace internally. We search for it. We go looking for it. We try to find it. And we don't have that peace that we're looking for. That peace is found when other people are first. That peace is found when you actually do love your enemy. And by the way, to love your enemy is nothing more than loving another person. You just don't see them as an enemy anymore. To love your enemy is not to see them as an enemy. They may call you an enemy, but if you render love to your fellow man, you're not calling them an enemy. You know they have sin in their lives and everything else. You begin to realize why you're here in the first place. Your life is full of purpose. I've been healthy at times, very healthy, extremely healthy. And everything in my life was dead. I've been broken multiple times and everything in my life was alive. We were teenagers once. We were young once. We had physical stamina, abilities, and everything else at our fingertips. And our life was empty. We're not young anymore. Many of us are not young anymore. Gravity is working. Things may not work right. But your life can be full of life. That's based on a decision. A decision many have not made yet. That's why people, nobody hears me complain. Not one person can ever hear me complain. And I don't have to hold my tongue. There's no complaint in me. Why? What complaint do I have? If I get shorted somewhere, something doesn't work out on me, it's no big deal. I keep going. Because what I'm doing, I'm doing for somebody else. And guess what? I expect Satan to resist anything God does in the earth. He's not a surprise. He's a resistor of God's word. So guess what? If you house God's word, he's going to be there to resist. It's when he does not resist you, you might want to sit back and worry. Because he's not going to resist something he already has. He will resist the word. So when you have these issues and problems and things and, you know, pop up in your life, Jimmy Crack Corn, you have to know why you're doing what you're doing. Dedicate your cause. 
be true to it and watch what happens. It's something that you never have to give a person promises in. But I'm telling you right now, you make your cause, true love, God's love. You'll be a recipient of what happens. That's when you stop complaining. That's when you're not doubting scriptures anymore. That's when you know things are more than possible. But you have to make that decision. God, he put the right circumstances around you. And you thought it was a disadvantage. The world would say, I'm highly disadvantaged. Yet it's the world that does not understand how I do what I do. I can even do, th there are delicate things I do with my hands with no feeling. No feeling whatsoever. And I'm going to be honest with you. It used to be when it first happened. It sent me into depression. Especially when you read up on what was happening and what it will ultimately do. It almost sent me into deep depression. Can you imagine not being able to feel anything anymore? And that it will spread out through other places. That you would never have certain enjoyments. That you would start looking at your life like it's just, you know, spiraling down into one big pit. And it was almost like the Lord said, well, if you're living for me, why are you so concerned about yourself? The Lord put me in check. Is what he, he does this all the time. I start getting in one of those modes. Scripture pops up. And it's almost like he's talking to me, telling me, well, I thought you lived for me. Didn't you tell others to love your neighbor? Well, what are you doing? You're loving yourself. And now you're mourning over yourself because you think you're going to be limited. Don't you believe in me? Yeah, all these things came back. How can I believe in the spiritual things and I'm afraid of flesh breaking down? See, he put me in check and it was a big blessing. It's not something anybody would voluntarily go through. These things happen. And when they happen, well, that's when you have to come clean. And when you come clean, the breakthroughs take place. It is so funny that you may not even ask for healing for the initial issue. You may not. In truth, I never asked for healing in my hands. You know that? I did it first when I was going into depression, and I did not get it. Since that time, and that's been the 90s, no need to pray for healing. Because I know this, as I serve the Lord in truth, He will empower me for whatever I need to do. So I don't really see limitations like that. If I'm serving Him and doing so in honesty, if He'll supply what I need according to His riches and glory, I found I need not ask for anything unless it be for one of you. Because He will empower me as my intent is directed towards Him and His gospel. That's why I am the way I am, attitude-wise. I never explained that to anybody, used it as an excuse or anything else. Because it's not about me, and it's not about that condition, it's not about me shining either. It's about folks being introduced to Christ in truth. And, and personally, I don't care what it takes. I told the Lord, use me as you will, period. His love is enough for me. Those who believe in Christ, and I say this all the time, but those who believe in Christ, they come from Christ, or they come from the Father. They will not remain part of the world, meaning no seed of God will remain in the world. That means no seed of God will be in corruption, but will be fully delivered. The entirety of your life is a discovery of actually who you are. Now, why would God ever do that? Why would he send us through this process? He created angels eternal. He gave them free will. Some chose not to obey him and they fell. But here you come, you're born through a, hu a frail human body into this earth, prone and subject to many things, made lower than the angels. But you're believing and becoming faithful to the living God without power, without that longevity, without all the miracle uh, uh, making things, without all this extraordinary knowledge or anything else. By faith, you're choosing Him. You're choosing Him through a means that cannot you can't trick your way into the kingdom of God. You're choosing him by way of a method that is uh, foolproof. Those who obey him with all the limitations will not fall away when they have everything. See, in, in, in people that are born in the earth, they try to get everything, don't they? Say, give me everything and then I'll follow you, Lord. The faithful are different. They end up saying, Lord, I'll follow you. And they stop looking for all this stuff that they need. Their list of what they need goes down and they say, I trust you, Lord. And they start utilizing what they have to serve him with. Because here's an ultimate truth. When we do things in life, if we wait till we get uh, to what we have and we put no effort towards what we're going to do, chances are we'll never utilize that stuff in the right way. Won't do it. But if a person is scrounging up everything to complete something, you buy that person something. 
they're going to complete it faster. That means when you don't have anything, you're trying to complete something. You don't take having a loss of materials as an excuse, but then you try everything. You're the one that will complete whatever that is. But if you stop saying you need this and you need that, you need that, you need that, you can't go any further until you have that, this, that, and the other. Well, that means you're likely to get that stuff. You're not going to finish. We're the ones who get the secondhand information, us, and we debate the crumbs they throw us, all the while they're preparing for something different than what they've told anybody. They teach us the false histories on these ruins, right? The people didn't come back from the past and explain to everybody what the real purpose of the pyramids and everything was. All of that was introduced by some person who was being paid, by the way, who came up with something that was plausible, something that was applicable, something that people could easily believe or argue or dispute with. They sell that story in education. That's what we run with. They know the true purpose of it. We do not. That's why there's mercury underneath those things. And that's why one of them has something active and it's been active since the time that Russia and Germany were there trying to open up the tombs. But we're the ones we often deny the truth for the sake of what? The disinformation they wrote down in books. All they have to do is get a couple plants right, get a couple dates right, get some of the math right, and we bought the history hook, line, and sinker. We think we know history by what somebody else wrote. And we call that truth? Are you kidding? That's how they fool people. Now, it'll be, but if you come out against it, it's going to be you against the world because the world has been indoctrinated in somebody else's propaganda. That's called education. You've been educated with somebody else's propaganda. All you have to do is throw some sciences of things that are factual and some math in there. And because of math and the sciences are true, observable, recreatable, and applicable, you say, well, the rest of it must be true. The history, the people, all the kingdoms, everything else that was given to you, that was written down, and somebody gave that to you. There's no way we can go verify it. So there we are. And then we wonder, well, why does God have to do all this stuff at the end so we don't continue to carry lies? That's why. Things must be uncovered. You must see the truth of what things are. Because if we don't, all of us will remain deceived. Why do you think sometimes it's hard to believe Scripture? It's because you already believe in something else. When you believe in nothing, it's easy to believe everything. But when you believe in something, it's hard to believe something else. We doubt truth only because something else we hold close to us is truth and it may contradict the new truth somebody is trying to introduce to us the lord must uncover everything or all of us would likely die with lies we would know the truth about hardly anything and if you don't think it's important that we know the truth how many people have defended knowledge in a book and called another person an idiot because they didn't believe what you believed from a book that's why I don't like talking about subjects unless I've been there, unless I've touched it or worked with it. And that limits me on what I can talk about. When you start seeing the truth of certain things, you'd ask yourself the same question. How in the world are you going to break this cycle, this lying cycle of people's beliefs and such rooted things? Because generation to generation, generation, we've been living with the same knowledge. But that doesn't make it true. Why do you think everybody's theorizing right now? They theorize because they know that something is not right with what they have. You can, Nobody can deny the funny looking lights and stuff in the sky. They can call it what they want to call it. But it is God that said he would, he would have everything spoken in secret yelled from the rooftops. That nothing that was spoken in silence is going to be kept secret. Everything is going to be exposed. He already told us that. It must be shown to all because we're in a very serious time. And they cannot hold on to propping up this illusion that things are standard, okay.